Hello and welcome. My name is Patrick Weiser. I'm a senior engineering director in Xilinx Research Labs, and I also lead the Xilinx University program. Today I have the pleasure of introducing the XACC Academia Industry Research Ecosystem. In this brief session, I will provide an outline of the XACC initiative. And then I will introduce the presenters that you will meet uh, in this session. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the structure of the session, and finally I'll share some brief notes on how it's organized. Across the many markets where electronics now plays a huge role in defining the end product, the future of computing is undoubtedly heterogeneous, intelligent, connected, and what we at Xilinx call adaptive. In particular, we now talk about adapting the architecture to the needs and characteristics of the application, rather than fitting the application to the few architectures that have dominated so far. And undoubtedly, this requirement for heterogeneous systems has to scale as our systems become more pervasive and more complex. The coming era of heterogeneous adaptive computing will undoubtedly pose many interesting and exciting research challenges. To resolve these challenges will require collaboration between academia and industry and the education of a new generation of graduates ready to embrace heterogeneous adaptive computing. To address these challenges, we have established the Xilinx Adaptive Compute Cluster program. In collaboration with four of the world's leading universities, we're now enabling world-class research in adaptive computing. Our partners include the University of California at Los Angeles, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and the National University of Singapore. So XACC is a special initiative designed to support research into accelerating computing with adaptive compute paradigms. The scope of the research is broad. It includes systems, architecture, tools, and applications. Our four very prestigious partners have been equipped with the latest Xilinx hardware and software technologies. And our goal is to foster a community of leading universities to conduct state-of-the-art research and to encourage many other schools to interact with them. And of course, it's not just restricted to academia. We welcome partnership from industry as well. Today, we will have the pleasure of listening to Professor Gustavo Alonso, who is the lead of the cluster at ETH in Zurich, Professor Jason Kong, who leads the cluster at UCLA, Professor Deming Cheng, who leads the cluster at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and Professor Bing Sheng He from the National University of Singapore, and also from Dr. Ivo Bolsons, our CTO at Xilinx, and the creator of the XACC program. So the outline for the remainder of this session we will hear first about XACC Zurich from Professor Alonso. That will be followed by an update on XACC Los Angeles by Professor Kong. Then an update on XACC Singapore from Professor Hay. And finally, an update on XACC Urbana Champagne from Professor Cheng. Then all four professors will join Dr. Ivo Molsons in a moderated panel discussion to consider the challenges and the opportunities of adaptive computing. Because of the challenges in scheduling an event like this across multiple time zones, all presentations have been pre-recorded. We ask that you please mute your microphones during the presentations and note that all questions and answers will be handled offline. To learn more about the Xilinx Adaptive Compute Clusters, please visit the XACC website at xilinx.github.io oblique XACC. To contact us with questions or requests, please follow the link at xilinx.com slash xup. I hope that you will enjoy the rest of the session and that you will find it interesting and productive. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gustavo Alonso. I am a professor at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and I'm going to be presenting you briefly what are the activities around the Xilinx Adaptive Computer and Cluster that we are running here at ETH uh, already for about a year and a half. So 
If you have not heard about these clusters, uh, there are four of them at the moment. There are two in the United States, uh, one in Singapore, and uh, another one in Switzerland, in the middle of Europe. And uh, this is, as, as you can see in the map here on the slide. So uh, how does the computer cluster look like? Uh, well, at the moment, the cluster looks uh, uh, as follows. It has five nodes. Uh, three of them have uh, two units in terms of the height of the, of, of in the rack. And then two of them have four units. Uh, there is, uh, of the five computer nodes that we have, there is one build node that is used for development. Uh, this is where we do the compilation and building and um, all the software development and so forth. And then there are four additional nodes that actually have FPGAs on them. We have a total of 10 FPGAs. Six of them are Alveo 250 cards and four of them are Alveo 280. And the way they're distributed in the cluster is that we have two nodes that have uh, two cards each, and those nodes have 250s. And there are two nodes that have three cards, uh, and the nodes that have three cards have two of them are 280s, and one of them is a, a 250. Okay. Uh, we have all the additional things that you expect to see in a cluster. There is a storage, uh, there is a shared disk for uh, in order to uh, store uh, the tools, the data, software, and so forth. Uh, and there is a 100 gigabit switch uh, on top of the rack where the host and the FPGAs are connected. The typical configuration is that the FPGAs will have only one port connected to the switch and the other port uh, is either not connected to anything or depending on what, are the need, what the needs are, might be connected to another FPGA. Uh, but in the future, the trend, and you will see why in a second, the trend uh, seems to be that we are going to have the FPGAs connected, uh, the two ports connected directly to the switch and have more uh, communication through the network rather than having communication directly between uh, the FPGAs. So uh, what is the current status of the cluster? Well, uh, it has been running since uh, essentially the beginning of last year. Uh, the advantage of having a cluster is that people can access remotely. So we have not been too much affected by the whole uh, COVID situation. And uh, we are seeing a lot of usage on the cluster and we are seeing, we're very glad to see that there is a lot of interest in using the cluster running applications and doing research on top of it. Uh, the users on the cluster are, of course, several groups uh, from uh, ETH, uh, both in computer science and electrical engineering. There are uh, over 100 external users uh, by now, and this number keeps increasing essentially every week, every two weeks, where we add another three, four, five uh, users that come from more than 25 institutions and almost as many countries uh, by now. Uh, in terms of what people are doing with the cluster, there is a wide range of uh, use cases and, and usage patterns, and people are trying to do many different things. Uh, there is a slight trend, and this probably reflects a little bit our own research, but also the type of things that we are doing together with Silings, uh, to uh, see the cluster as an opportunity to actually explore distributed applications that run on FPGA clusters. So uh, running applications that use not only one FPGA, but actually use several FPGAs, and our goal would be to actually have uh, the 10 FPGAs connected together and deploy applications that actually run on the 10 FPGAs. And this is actually going moving a little bit in the direction of what you are seeing in the cloud, uh, especially things like what Microsoft has done with Microsoft Catapult and so on. Uh, in addition to the cluster, we are also working uh, in trying to develop a set of tools uh, as part of our community tools that are open source uh, and include uh, network stacks like for TCP IP, for RDMA, uh, a project that we have uh, together with uh, Silings. We are developing an MPI library for FPGA communication. Uh, we are developing our own research shells, uh, many applications that are also making open source so that people can actually use them to uh, try things in the cluster and also try to do different things in terms of uh, research. So this is a cluster. Now, let me briefly tell you a little bit about the type of research that we are doing uh, on the cluster uh, so that you get a bit of an impression of what's going on uh, around this work. So uh, the research that we do can actually be classified into rough uh, general directions. Uh, one of them is actually infrastructure, uh, systems and system support. Uh, in order to sort of learn how to actually build clusters, how to deploy these uh, FPGAs a large scale in eventually something like a data center or in cloud computing and so forth. And this involves uh, research and work uh, at all levels on operating systems, uh, on shells for the FPGA, I'll give you an example in a second, network stacks, both for TCP IP and RDMA, uh, smart NICs, uh, we're also working on cache coherency protocols, trying to figure out exactly what this means for FPGAs to have a protocol that is cache coherent, and also trying to study how we're going to embed an FPGA 
into a wider ecosystem of both hardware and software. The FPGA is not something that uh, in a data center in the cloud is completely isolated. It will be in a host or be connected to the network. And the question is that how do you build a whole uh, ecosystem of software that you need to have in place in order to make it easy to actually use uh, that FPGA. So this is one side of the things that we do, essentially systems work on how to actually work around uh, and with FPGAs. And uh, the other uh, part of work, that, or the other type of work that we do is applications. And here we have a very wide range of applications just to sort of not spend too much time on it. Uh, let me just summarize and say that we're doing quite a bit of work on data processing, uh, relational stream, streams, uh, stream data processing, but also have quite a bit of work on machine learning. And uh, lately we have also started working on things like recommender systems, uh, all of them trying to explore what is it that we can do with FPGAs that actually improves the state of the art and actually pushes research a little bit uh, farther than what it is to be. Now, of course, we're a university. The type of research that we do is academic research. We're interested in things that are more on the medium and long term rather than short term. However, we put a lot of emphasis in making sure that our research is grounded in reality. So we do have a lot of collaborations with industry and we actually have a very intense dialogue with uh, different companies to try to understand what are the real needs today, what happens with existing systems, uh, what are the limitations of existing systems in order to actually uh, find out what is it that we can do with new hardware, in particular uh, with FPGAs. Uh, here in the slide, you see a few examples of some of the projects that we have. Uh, for instance, together with HP, we're working on disaggregated memory. This is a project where we are taking persistent memory with an FPGA and then put it directly on the network uh, in order to have uh, some form of a smart network attached memory for the cloud. We have another project with uh, SAP where we're using a smart NIC implemented with an FPGA in order to offload the whole IO work uh, related to our relational engine, which is actually quite uh, heavy. Uh, and looking into the cloud, you, these databases, actually the storage uh, is not done on a local computer, it's done through the network. So it actually makes sense to actually have this on the SmartNIC. And if we have an FPGA, then we can actually uh, not only just do the communication, but I can, we can actually do some data processing as the data comes back and forth. And uh, the initial results that we have shows that this is actually very promising and probably we can actually uh, save a lot of, uh, make the system much more efficient than they are today. The additional projects that we have are, for instance, embedding FPGAs in large scale uh, search engines. This is a project that we have had with Amadeus for a couple of years. Uh, recently, we have started working on recommender systems with companies like Alibaba. And uh, together with Xilinx, we are actually working on an MPI communication library for FPGA clusters. Right? I mean, uh, now you see the connection to what I said earlier about uh, using the cluster more and more as a collection of FPGAs rather than uh, just single FPGAs that can be used individually. Okay. Uh, an important part of what we do is that uh, all of our results are public and are available as open source projects. And uh, we hope that that will actually contribute together with the cluster, will actually, that will actually contribute to creating a community and increasing the amount of people who can actually um, have access to FPGAs and do increasingly more complex systems through this uh, 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 open source software. Uh, now, very briefly, uh, additional things that we're doing, uh, or more concretely, uh, some of the projects that we have so that you get a bit of uh, uh, an idea of what we have been doing. And some of them are actually have been presented at, uh, at people at Silence in the past, or uh, is actually work done with Silence. Uh, and uh, there are publications about them, so you can actually go and read the paper. So I'm not going to spend too much time here in the interest uh, of time. Uh, so one of the things that we have uh, that we did last year is uh, a research shell for the FPGA. This is what we call an operating system for the FPGA in the sense that what we have done is that uh, we have actually taken uh, one of those Aveo cards and then we have actually put our own shell that uh, provides multiple user regions uh, that are completely independent of each other. We can have between six to 10, depending on how big you want to have them. Uh, the shell already contains network stacks, the RDMA TCP IP network stacks. They're all presented to the user uh, with the standard interfaces. So you don't have to consider the network. You don't have to deal with the network stack on the user logic. You just are using the standard interfaces. Uh, we provide a unified memory space between the FPGA and the host uh, with virtual memory. So we can actually pass pointers back and forth between the CPU and the FPGA without actually the user logic having to bother with the translation. This is all done by the shell. And of course, and this is one of the reasons why we call this an operating system for FPGAs, 
Uh, the shell does a lot of the management that comes with having uh, these virtual FPGAs, as we call them, right? I mean, uh, or essentially processes, threads that are running on the FPGA just to make sure that they're isolated, that they have a first share of the network, first share of access uh, through the PCI bus to the memory of the host, uh, and so forth. Uh, another example of infrastructure work that we're doing is EasyNet. This is the culmination of actually quite a few years of work on networking stacks for FPGA. Uh, this is fully open source, uh, works at 100 gigabits per second, works very well, has been actually quite, quite debugged and improved and optimized uh, over the last year, year and a half. Uh, and now it's actually being used to build clusters of FPGAs I have already mentioned a couple of times. Uh, <clears throat> just as an example of the type of things that we're doing, we have right now an ongoing collaboration with Silings. Uh, uh, where uh, we're actually implementing an MPI-like uh, functionality or MPI-like library uh, for FPGAs that, to, again, just make it easier for people to build distributed applications on, tops, on top of uh, FPGAs. And if you're attending uh, FPL in a few weeks, uh, then we have a paper where actually we describe uh, EasyNet in a bit more detail. Now, finally, I want to conclude with a little bit more uh, detail of a particular application, although this is just one example of several of the things that we are doing. And this is actually using an FPA in the context of a recommended system. And I hope that this gives you a bit of an idea of the type of things that we do uh, in terms of uh, finding out where we can actually use an FPA most efficiently. So recommender systems are, are systems that are used for uh, analyzing data and try to come up with some sort of recommendation. Uh, typically, they're used by uh, electronic commerce sites to actually recommend um, product to buy or try to predict uh, what will be the click-through rate for particular products and so forth. Um, without getting into a lot of details, uh, one of the aspects of these recommender systems is that they have these embedding tables that are used to take the sparse features uh, that you want to sort of run through your uh, model and then turn it into dense features that can actually be fed into a neural network. It turns out that implementing these embedding tables is a complicated matter in terms of performance uh, because you can actually have tens to hundreds of these tables. Uh, the tables can have uh, hundreds of billions of entries. Uh, they, they can have between four to 64 dimensions, right, uh, and so forth. And then for every question that you want to ask to the model, uh, every, every input that you want to rank or classify, you actually need to run through these embedded, uh, potentially hundreds of tables, right? I mean, I try to do the mapping, the translation of your input into something that you can actually feed into the neural network. That's actually very expensive. So we actually working with Alibaba, we figured out that we can actually do this much better with an FPGA. We had a paper uh, this year at uh, MLCs, um, Systems for Machine Learning Conference, uh, where we actually saw how to use an FPGA to run the entire recommendation system uh, and actually put in the uh, embedded tables, uh, taking advantage of uh, high bandwidth memory, the, the one that is available on the 280, uh, to actually implement uh, using a number of clever tricks uh, in implementing the embedding table uh, or the embedding tables so that this, the whole system is much faster than what they actually have uh, today. Uh, in more recent work, and this is something that uh, is, uh, will be, has been presented recently at KDD and Machine Learning Conference, we actually saw how to do this uh, in an even better way in a distributed fashion, combining both the GPU, where we actually run the DNN computation, and FPGAs, where we do the embedding uh, tables, and in a way that you not only can run one single model, but you can actually run many different models at the same time and do an arbitrary combination of FPGAs, GPUs running uh, a bigger model on the GPU and something smaller on the FPGA or running uh, many tables on the FPGA and then a smaller model on the GPU. So we actually saw that this actually is all possible and the performance that we get is very, very interesting compared to what is the, the, the state of here. So let me finish here. Uh, I think hardware acceleration and hybrid architectures are here to stay. There, are, there is a huge demand in many areas uh, for solutions that can improve over the state of the art. And I think FPGAs can play a big role in there. However, uh, the big challenge today is that uh, there has to be much better infrastructure uh, to develop applications and to actually use these systems without actually having to invest so much time to just make it run or connect them to the network or connect them to the host uh, and so forth. And uh, I see this initiative uh, on the Silence Adaptive Computer Cluster uh, as a way to actually create the necessary critical mass to, to tackle these problems, uh, creating a community, fostering talent, exploring a large design space, and so forth. Uh, 
We're extremely grateful uh, to Childings uh, for the cluster that has enabled a lot of very good research in, uh, in our group at ETH. And also, as we see by the number of people who are actually interested in running the cluster across the whole academic community worldwide, uh, that has been a great step forward. Uh, as I said, we are very grateful and we look forward to continue the collaboration. So thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jason Kahn, a faculty member in the computer science department at UCLA. I already also directs the uh, Center uh, Lab for the VRSI Architecture Synthesis and the Technology. Uh, I'm glad to share with you some of our research on making a PGA easy to program. Um, so here's an overview about the research program in our lab. Uh, I'm going to focus on the first topic, uh, programming infrastructure for heterogeneous architectures. But we also have research going on acceleration of the deep learning uh, for cloud and edge computing, uh, customized acceleration of big data applications. And also um, in dealing with uh, machine learning related topics, we also have a very close collaboration with our faculty in uh, neuroscience areas on brain inspired computing and also using accelerated techniques to help them to analyze the brain. Uh, we also have a very active program on near data computing uh, or acceleration. Uh, finally, we have a fairly recent program uh, on architecture and design automation for quantum computing, which uh, I'll be happy to share at a different time. Uh, many of these research are uh, done on the uh, Zadinx XACC clusters. We are very grateful for the contribution from Zadinx. Here is a view of the, the physical infrastructure we have set up with four state of art servers, and each one has two to four Zadinx uh, IVO cards. And in total, we have uh, uh, 13 uh, high end uh, IVO Zadinx FPGA cards. And then we have a, a different layer of system software and the user space software. Uh, what they give us is a uh, uh, a cluster which we can manage very easily, for example, looking at the critical events and uh, happening snapshots of restoration, and also we can monitor the cluster status. Um, some of the, uh, quite a number of uh, outside researchers has been using the cluster. I'm highlighting a few here. Uh, Professor Tony Nowaski at UCLA, his group is mainly on computer architecture research, doing a lot of interesting work on uh, prototyping on uh, PGAs. Uh, uh, Professor Pei Bei Zhou, uh, she was a former member of the lab, now is a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, her interest is mainly on uh, heterogeneous acceleration using experience. Uh, Professor Zhu Zhang, uh, leading a very active, uh, exciting research program at Cornell. We have a collaboration on storage uh, uh, acceleration. Um, so uh, let me just focus on the topic for today is making a PGA easy to program. You may say, is that still a problem? We have high-level synthesis. Indeed, high-level synthesis is great. And uh, uh, the, the best part is that uh, almost uh, for any C program, if you can get rid of those pointers, system calls, recursions, um, for this kind of a, a loop-based structure, you give it to high-level synthesis tool, you will get a result and the uh, implementation in hardware in IPGAs. Uh, the bad news is that uh, most of the time you get a, a, a architecture, get a solution, which is not efficient, that uh, is even slower than a single core CPU. So this example I've shown you is uh, the well-known that the uh, uh, CNN uh, algorithm just for one layer for illustration. If you give it to the uh, HLS compiler as a three, uh, nested loops and then you come up with a solution uh, with only a single, which actually is slow down, uh, uh, slower than a uh, single core CPU. But this is not a fundamental limitation. You can actually uh, do quite a bit optimization on the code. Uh, for example, the things you can do is that you can create the, the B1 uh, buffers, uh, B1 buffers for data access you can introduce fine-grained pipelining, fine-grained parallelism, and, uh, and, and a, a coarse-grained pipelining. And as a result, that uh, you now, uh, after all this optimization, you get a 7,000x speed up that the over a single thread CPU. Uh, however, the problem is that, that you have uh, maybe uh, 10, uh, 20 lines of a C code. Now it becomes a 
150 lines of C code, more, more important than these 28 paragraphs. And those programs tell the pilot synthesis what to do, right? To do pipelining, uh, the, the, the parallelization or memory partition. So this is a high barrier for a lot of uh, uh, programmers, especially software oriented programs to use FPGAs. So now our goal is to make this barrier completely uh, disappeared or as low as possible. So the approach we go with that is that uh, you can still from, from C program, I will show you that uh, we can also allow you to raise the level of abstraction to start from so-called the domain specific programs. And uh, the, some of these high level programs we support as Spark, Cafe, Haylight. I will give you an example about Haylight. We will actually lower it down to uh, intermediate representation. Uh, in our case, we are using the uh, OpenCL uh, program, which developed jointly between Cornell, UCLA, and published in FGJ 2019, uh, two years ago. From there, we can do so called uh, microarchitecture optimization. Uh, in the automated fashion. So that will actually replace all the code rewriting on the program insertion you have, because there's a, a number of very uh, well-known and very efficient microarchitecture we want to explore. For example, for the CI example, you can use systolic arrays. If you have image processing and uh, stencil pattern is very important. If you say, I really do not know that uh, what to use, actually we can we have a fairly general uh, pattern called the composable parallel. Uh, Pipeline architecture or CPP in short. Uh, for more general application, we use some machine learning techniques that are to do the automated design space exploration. After this automatic uh, the micro architecture level optimization, we can generate a, a new uh, high level synthesis program that the WISP program has inserted for the FPGA implementation. So let me give you some examples that, uh, as I said, the goal uh, is to democratize FPGA design. So not only the experts that uh, with uh, degrees in electrical engineering, um, but uh, hopefully uh, many, many software programmers can also enjoy the efficient of our FPGA based acceleration. So one, uh, the first example I give it to you is uh, the systolic compilation. Uh, many of you have heard about uh, the Google TPUs for accelerating deep learning. The underlying architecture is uh, uh, a systolic array. Um, so we want to do the same thing on FPGAs. So with the now automated tool, you can just write this, for example, uh, three-level nested loop for matrix multiplication without any problem. The only thing you need to identify is that uh, we actually use this SCOP scope to define the, uh, the boundary for systolic rate. As long as you specify this being a systolic rate, we can generate uh, a uh, array, either 1D or 2D of a processing engines, and they are connected by local communication in horizontal vertical directions. And within each PE that you can actually have registers, uh, map, uh, multiplication simulation unit, and also local storage if needed. Uh, under the hood, what we are doing is that uh, go through a number of steps. One is the space-time uh, space mapping to decide what set of loops will be back to the spatial array, what set of loops will be executed sequentially on each PEs. And uh, the array on the FPG will be a, a fixed dimension, for example, 28 by 36. Your real array will be much bigger, could be much bigger. So we'll do an automatic array partition. Um, you may actually do in either fixed point or floating point operation. Some of these floating point operation takes more than one cycle to complete. So then we can actually execute different tasks uh, to hide the latency. And then finally, just for the efficiency, we actually do the SIMD vectorization for each to use. So with this kind of automation, and uh, at the end, uh, you can see that uh, we can now, uh, with that uh, out of the box compilation, getting uh, uh, the efficient of uh, several uh, terabytes of uh, operation per second, this is the, uh, the best among all the results published in the literature. Um, it's not only for matrix multiplication for CN and a number of other numerical computations. The second example is uh, the stencil computation for image processing or even some PDE equations. It's often the case that uh, you want to update one point with nearby points, right? You are doing it not just for one uh, that the pixel, but you are doing it for all pixel. 
the key in this case is that uh, first you actually want to make sure memory is properly partitioned, that uh, you don't actually uh, have a memory conflict when you access these five points. And you want to make sure it's the case for every pixel as you move. That, uh, the second challenge is that uh, there's some data reuse. You want to make sure the data can be reused to the maximum extent. There is no repeated computation. So, uh, so this is actually where we can, again, again compile into a very elegant microarchitecture implementation with a number of uh, uh, FIFOs uh, to store the images. And, uh, and then we actually will forward it in a uh, fashion that uh, so we'll maximize the data we use, we'll minimize the on-chip storage, and then we can prove mathematically this is the best possible solution we'll have. Now with this kind of a result, um, you can see that uh, we can uh, consistently outperform not only CPUs, even GPUs. So the, the first bar is the multi course CPU implementation. The second bar is the, uh, the Xeon 5 um, many core uh, the, uh, processors. And then the third one is the GPU. The last two are actually the GGA implementation. One is the with computation reuse, the other one is without. Uh, that's just the one technique, uh, optimization technique. You can see in almost all applications and uh, uh, a PGA that uh, outperform both uh, CPUs and GPUs. We, this is probably the only exception uh, we have. I can explain why that's the case. Uh, this is one is actually with limited uh, 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 computation intensity. You can say that's great. If you have to start race then so I know what to do. But uh, what about the general programs? It turned out that for general programs that uh, we can actually use uh, uh, automatic design space exploration to figure out uh, what program to, uh, what programs to insert. Uh, but the first step is that we want to reduce the number of programs that are in the high level synthesis. This is actually, we did quite a bit of research on this. There's a spin up company from UCLA called the Falcon Computing that was acquired by Zilinx last year. And uh, this compiler called the Merlin compiler uh, will be open sourced very soon. And so what's uh, in that uh, Merlin compiler? Merlin pro compiler presents a, a programming interface which is extremely simple. Basically has two programmers. You can either parallel or pipeline. You say, oh, what about the other programmers to partition the arrays and things like that. So this will be all uh, implemented automatically. Uh, some of you know some multi-core CPU program uh, using this language called OpenMT. You basically say Pragma or MT parallel and you can specify a number of threads you want to use. And uh, with Berlin, it's very much similar. You can just say Pragma Excel and then you can say, you know, I need to parallelize this loop. The factor is 16. And there's a, a, a similar one for pipeline as well. Uh, under the hood, uh, then the Merlin will do on-chip memory banking, partitioning, delinearization, external memory burst, streaming, coalescing, and also will generate from this code, the OpenCL code automatically for both host and the, uh, the kernel code. And uh, as a result, there's a significant uh, uh, pragma reductions. So this is a joint study done with the designings. Uh, if you look at the Zynix put out a lot of open source libraries. So we focus on this open CD library. There's a uh, 50 plus HLS uh, functions there, and, uh, manually optimized with the pragmas inserted. Um, so on the average, each program has about 20, 21 pragmas. And with Merlin, you have between one to two pragmas. Uh, so that's represented 15 X reduction. Also that uh, in terms of latency, there's really no, uh, that the, uh, Performance degradation is about uh, exactly uh, the same or slightly better. So uh, now our current research is actually to remove this last one or two uh, that the uh, pragmas. Uh, so basically, we're automatically going to search where to parallel, where to pipeline. Uh, that these are the main pragmas is invited uh, that that's remaining uh, to be inserted. Um, so uh, that involves several steps. One is that, that we can. We want to design it, uh, define a design space, and then the partition of design space, and then to do efficient exploration. And then the objective can be performance or area, it can be combination of that, uh, or some trade off. 
So the good news I can tell you that uh, with uh, this initial re result called the uh, auto DSC, we can completely get rid of the uh, HRS and Berlin uh, fragments that are on this uh, uh, open CV example. And uh, again, with a comparable or slightly better performance. So finally, you can say, oh, all these programs are CC plus pro programs, but the community is also moving to actually more DSLs, what do we do there? So here is the, the I mentioned this briefly, that the, the joint work we did with Cornell, Professor Drew John's group uh, called HydroCL. And uh, we actually, this is inspired by Highlight programming style. We can separate uh, the algorithm specification from the performance tuning. Uh, that you can customize the computation, customize the real time, customize the memory organization for performance optimization, right? Using this as an intermediate step, we can actually um, that, uh, support the various kind of high level uh, DSLs. At the back end, we can map to processors or FPGAs or even GPUs. So, on the FPGA side, we support the, the following back end. We talk about the systolic array stencil. We also support the Merlin C compiler. Um, you can actually start from a hydro, uh, hydro program, for example. This is a hydro halide program we have and it's very high level description. And then with one line to indicate that the optimization we want to perform. Uh, and then we'll generate that uh, all the, the backend implementation for you. So uh, these actually a set of uh, uh, halide programs you can get it from the public domain to do, for example, dousing, like the denoising, and deep learning, and a number of other applications. Uh, with uh, no change that we can actually get a, a speed up of 4.15x and the energy efficiency 11x over uh, 28 core CPU designs. And we can use different backend that the stencil, systolic array, or general version compiler. So in conclusion, that uh, uh, many of you remember the, the statement made by Patterson and Hennessy in their Turing Award lecture. Uh, saying that we are at the golden age of uh, computer architecture. We absolutely agree. And our mission is actually to make sure not just computer architects can generally uh, can participate in this excitement. And so are every, that, uh, so is every uh, software programmer. And he can build his own that, uh, customized accelerator on FPGAs, either on premise or in the cloud. Um, so uh, all these tools I'm talking about is available in the UCLA XACC cluster. Uh, we invite you to uh, talk to, uh, to work with us and then make it uh, even better, right? And then also try it out uh, on this cluster. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Bing Sun He from National University of Singapore. In this presentation, I will give an update about XACC at NUS. And then I will give an overview about our research activities. So far, we have already set up the hardware in NUS. The hardware actually is uh, donated by Zynix. And also, in addition, Zynix and has donated 10 FPG cards to us. We have configured the machine as shown in this figure. As you, you can see in this figure, we have three nodes. Each node has two uh, LVO U250. This setup actually allows us to look at uh, distributed systems that, run, that can be running on multiple, FPG, multiple FPGAs on different machines. And then if you look at the bottom, we have one server node with four uh, LVO U280 FPGA. So this allows us to research on system that can run on scale up architectures with multiple FPGAs in a single server. So this is really an interesting setup that allows us to look at different uh, system configurations. So now let's talk about our research. So in the past few years, we have tried to use FPJ as a data accelerator because we feel that FPJ is more energy efficient and also FPJ can offer very fine grain, massive parallelism. So as you can see in this slide, we actually start with looking at how we can actually improve the programmability and performance optimization of HLS, high level synthesis. Here we actually start with OpenCL and C. We find that actually HLS with uh, OpenCL and C uh, still, we need a lot of effort 
to tune and optimize the performance. So that's why we start with developing and research some tools to help users to analyze the program and also optimize the performance. And then we we find that even with HRS, it's, it's, still not if, if, it's still not enough to achieve high programmability. So that's why we actually we want to research how we can uh, this, develop some common APIs so that the users can uh, use those API and avoid the complexity of programming at PGA. As a first step, we actually look at MapReduce. As, we, as you may know, MapReduce is very popular in cluster computing. Actually, in those library, user can only need to write uh, the two functions, map function and the reduce function. And all the underlying complexity are actually hidden by the runtime. So we actually have the same idea here. We define uh, Mania. So Mania is actually the first FPGA-based uh, MapReduce system. So with, that system, with Mania, the user can, can actually just divide their map function and reduce function and then their data task can be automatically run on FPGA. And still, we have a lot of optimizations to improve the memory efficiency and also load balancing and so on. So on top of that, we look at even larger scale of data management systems to see how we can actually use FPGA as a data accelerator. So we have research relational database. So we look at very challenging uh, operators such as partitioning, data partitioning, because it has a lot of irregular uh, memory access and also hash joins, and even more complex query processing. We achieve many promising results there. And more recently, we look at um, uh, bar processing, which actually is more interesting and, and also more challenging, as I mentioned later. Here, we, we look at how we do data shuffling within the graph, how we do BFS, and also we developed the two uh, open source system, Sunder GP and the Sundering. I will, I, I will give you more details in the later slides. So why we do graph? Okay, graph actually is quite pervasive in a lot of applications. And as in practice, a lot of companies and a lot of applications need to process large graph of millions of vertex to billions of vertex and even bigger. Okay, so clearly, we need high performance and energy efficiency for those uh, graph processing tasks. And then we look at how we can actually use FPGA as a graph accelerator. We start with looking at literature, okay? We, we actually compare different literatures with the, a number of dimensions. For example, API, whether, they, whether the existing work offers some high level uh, programming API and PL, what is the programming language, whether they use hardware description languages or, or HRS. And also whether they have auto design flow and so on and so on. And also public, okay, whether they, the system is public available, because we believe making the system public available can, can make FPG with wider adoptions and also with, uh, can help on the system and the evaluation uh, with producibility. Okay. But unfortunately, we find that actually the systems, exist systems are far from ideals. Okay, let's look at some details. As you can see, actually most of the system uh, do not offer some, some kind of high level APIs. And most of them based on H HDL, hardware description languages. So basically as a software engineer, it's very difficult to use those systems. And as you can see, the other one, they, they don't offer uh, and only very few of a um, automatic, the automated uh, design flow. And, and, and even worse is in terms of public available is actually only three of them make their system available. So I think in, in summary, the existing work is uh, actually far from ideal. More research effort have been, has to be paid there. Okay, so that's why we, we developed a system called Sunder GP. We, in this slide, I will talk about the, uh, briefly talk about the technical challenges and also our solution. The first of all is how we, how we actually can support various graph processing algorithms. And especially we want to support them efficiently. So in this way, we actually design an efficient architectural template with the adoption of the GS model. 
So first of all, we actually try to have a template. Okay, so because we find all the graph processing algorithms are very different from each other, at the end of the day, they can actually can be formulated as some kind of template. And then we can actually customize those templates for different applications. And then we, in, in order to enable programming without the hardware expertise, so basically we want to program the system with high level programming languages. Then we actually offer and some high level APIs under the GS model. And then is and then so that the developers can only need to implement a few small, a few small functions, and then all the rest to generate the accessible code and so on are left to the system itself. And, and the last one is actually how to actually fully unleash the hardware features or raw hardware power of the FPGA. So we actually develop a, a lot of heuristics on memory efficiency and so that they can scale to mounting SLR FPGAs and also high bandwidth memory. And we can schedule the data pipelines efficiently on the FPGA. So in the end, we put them all together is the system called Sound GP. So this shows you the, the system architecture overview of uh, Sounder GP. So as I mentioned just now, actually it has an accelerator template. So the user basically will, will have the input here is the, as you can see, basically is the user defined functions of the GS model, gather, apply and scatter, okay? And then the input is also the hardware platform model, like whether it's a U250 or U280 and so on and so on. So based on those information, we will do, as you can see, the system itself will do graph partitioning as the graph can be large. FPGA has limited memory. So that's why we need to have partition uh, the graph for, so that the processing of a graph partition can fit into FPGA or even, even the block RAM for high-speed processing. And then based on the hardware model and also user-defined function, we actually regenerate a serrator based on the template. So putting them all together, then we can have a very efficient uh, runtime system for running the graph processing task on FPGA. So at the end, if you look at the result, we compare the state of the result is, uh, as the reference is given in, uh, in the bottom. Um, in general, the related work are actually implemented in RTL. So basically in very low level hardware description languages. And we look at different applications like sparse metrics, vector multiplication, page rank, BFS, sortist path. So as you can see on different application, on different graph, okay, uh, this is the short name for the graph data set, but they are large graph. For more details about the data sets and the application, you can refer to our paper. So we compare the absolute throughput and also the bandwidth efficiency. As you can see in this table, we, we achieve a very high uh, speed up of in both absolute throughput and also bandwidth, bandwidth efficiency uh, over the, the other state of the art. So performance speed up is one thing, but the other thing I want to highlight is that the programmability of our system is much better than those uh, existing systems because the users on some of the GP only need to implement a few high level APIs. Okay, so you can see our GitHub for more uh, details. And beside that, we actually try to extend some GPU to handle dynamic graph because recently we looked at application in digital finance. We want to address, use the graph to actually uh, to detect the fraud, the fraud in digital finance in real time. So that's why we, we must be, have the capability to handle dynamic graph. And in order to imp further improve the performance, we need to take advantage of the high bandwidth memory. So actually, exactly this is we should thank uh, uh, Zynix to, for donating hardware because. Uh, those FPJ can actually have the HBM capability. And, and, and when we do uh, the fraud detection, the other graph processing algorithm we use is graph neural, graph neural network. And in graph neural, neural network, the very common thing is that we need to do uh, random work. In random work on the graph, we need to generate a lot of random numbers. So that's why we look at the efficiency and also the quality of the random number generation on FPGA. However, again, we find that existing work is far from ideal. They, they, they either are uh, resource uh, limited because it's very hard to, uh, they actually have, because the existing design is 
actually cost a lot of resource when they scale the number of um, uh, the number of generators. Because when the work, basically we need a lot of uh, streams of random numbers generation. And also exist number of generations that they have poor quality. So that's why we need to develop a system that is high throughput, high quality, and scalable. We call it sundering. The sundering, the key idea behind that is that on each top, on each uh, when the number generator, it has some state. Okay, we have some state there. So basically, in in this piece of work, we have the very efficient way of um, sharing the state. So that actually, no matter how many uh, random number generator, we only have one portion, uh, one copy of uh, the shared state. But the problem of the shared state is the correlation. So that's why we come up with a very lightweight decorrelation modules to on the FPG so that we can actually have both high quality and high throughput. Okay, for more detail, you can refer to our paper. So at the end, we compare the performance and also look at the resource consumption. So this figure shows you the resource consumption. The blue line here shows the resource consumption on the DSP. So XX, X axis is actually, we vary the number of instance in the basically the number of streams that generated random numbers in parallel. As we increase the number of instances, the number of DSP almost keep constant. So this is very good resource consumption of our design. And if you look at the number of the, the throughput, actually we, we can generate as the top performance on one single IPJ, it can reach uh, 600, 6, 655 giga numbers when number generated per second. So this is really an, um, a very suitable performance number. So as a matter of fact, we compare with the libraries on um, on the GPU. On uh, actually, we can achieve very good uh, performance improvement and over one order of magnitudes on power efficiency. Okay. So for more detail about Thunder GP and Thundering, they are all open source. They are in our system uh, uh, GitHub website. So for more details, you you can refer to. So in summary. So XACC and NUS as a platform actually offer many opportunities for accelerated data management and machine learning uh, research. So for more, for more results and more updates about my research and system can be found in this GitHub. And finally, I, I want to thank Linux to give us the strong support and also the hardware donation, especially uh, the, the colleagues of the Zynix lab in Singapore uh, they offer their time and also great effort to support us uh, during this uh, challenging period. And also, we thank other XACC centers for their insightful discussions and knowledge sharing. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Daiming Chen from UIUC. I will introduce the Xilinx Adaptive Compute Cluster at UIUC. So we have uh, quite some faculty members involved for the XACC research. This include both UIUC faculty and uh, external collaborators from other institutes. In the same time, we have uh, a group of very talented, uh, hardworking students who are working on various research topics. This is possible because uh, Zilinx also established uh, Zilinx Center of Excellence at UIUC. And we are having uh, regular meetings with Zilinx researchers and collaborators right, uh, for brainstorming. Right? So they have been offering very instrumental uh, inputs and, and uh, vision and uh, for the future roadmap of technology, all these are moving forward very well. So currently, UIUC XCCC supports 69 student users uh, across different institutes, and there are four pending users for approval. And this graph shows the number of job runs since uh, August 2020. So uh, here is a picture to show the layout, right? So it uh, includes one hand nodes and five compute nodes. Okay, so overall it includes a ton of real IPJ cards, two SN1000 smart mix and several uh, GPU and also uh, some virtual cards that are not included here. Right, so these are used for dedicated research activities uh, such as virtualization you know, uh, PCIe traffic monitoring and uh, fast comp compilation, et cetera. 
And then all the nodes are connected by the 100 gigabit uh, per second uh, um, Ethernet switch and the uh, cables. And then we use a Slurm job manager to flexibly share resources. So overall, this cluster offers the following unique features, uh, right? It is heterogeneous, right? You can see some nodes uh, has both U250 and U280 connected by the high-speed links. Some nodes has both IPDA and the GPUs, right? So these are ideal for heterogeneous system computing. Okay, and it's high speed, it's flexible, and also we uh, start to uh, kind of uh, uh, provide uh, NIC features right? and also have a smart NIC installed, right? So this can facilitate high speed uh, you know, communication across different nodes, and then even build additional features uh, such as uh, security and uh, um, compression, decompression on top of these cards. Okay, and finally, it's adaptive, right? So this is uh, XACC, right? So uh, we can reconfigure the uh, topologies and different configurations uh, to support different research goals. Okay, so overall, our research activities uh, are investigating system solutions, right, for HPC, for distributed computing, for ML, and then create new opportunities in data center and, and HPC domains, right? Mainly focusing on uh, flexibility of memory hierarchy, right? Different level of uh, parallelization with network IPDAs and other type of accelerators. So we have four research thrusts. I'm going to introduce more details on this uh, in the next slide. Okay, so the first thrust is the compilers and language uh, thrust. So here we'll uh, focus on programmability, right, which is a challenging but important uh, topic for reconfigurable computing. So here we will uh, mainly uh, study, uh, you know, new high-level sensor solutions and programming models and uh, fast compilers. The second thrust is the systems solution. Right, we uh, focus on flexibility, scalability, and heterogeneity. And here we are building innovative uh, frameworks for unified uh, memory, virtualization, scheduling, right, targeting multiple IPDA and uh, multiple accelerator setups. So the third thrust is distributed computing, networking, and storage. Here we mainly target parallelization, security, and reliability. Right, the projects include smart NICs, uh, right, cloud uh, remote procedure calls, uh, NVMe over fabric, near data acceleration, and security and reliability. We also uh, use uh, domain specific languages uh, such as P4 and eBPF to target cloud computing. And then finally, we are developing no, uh, novel applications and algorithms acceleration. So notice that uh, these trusts are not mutually exclusive, right? For example, system sol solutions also need high programmability, right? And then this distributed computing networking also needs scalability and uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, heterogeneous, right? Across different nodes. Okay, and meanwhile, if we develop all this well, and uh, yeah, so these are the system, right, compiler solutions that can naturally enable high-speed acceleration for various type of applications, uh, which is our ultimate goal, right? So this XACC program also offers a nice inter-XACC collaboration opportunities. For example, our unified memory work is uh, built on top of QUT, offered from uh, ETH uh, XACC. And then we are also collaborating with NUS XACC for grass, uh, graph processing. So for the remaining time, let me highlight several key projects uh, coming out of the, these research activities. So the first one is called PyLog, right? PyLog is an algorithm-centric FPGA programming with Python, right? So PyLog uh, provides a high-level abstraction of FPGA programming, right? So this is higher level than the current state of the art, uh, such as those using C, C++, or OpenCL, right? So we believe uh, Python can actually offer uh, more efficient algorithmic uh, specification. 
And also it exposes more optimization opportunities through the compiler. Okay. So you can see they build uh, this new flow, right? So uh, we annotate the code with a PyLog uh, term and annotation, right? So then they build a syntax tree and they carry out optimizations on top of the syntax tree and provide uh, optimized type of sensor solutions, right? And uh, target uh, different uh, uh, platforms. I will uh, you know, touch on this in the next slide also. Okay, so on average, uh, PyLog offer more than three x speed up, right, compared to highly optimized CPU solutions, and twenty four percent faster result compared to many manually toned RPG accelerators, right. So the quality of the results is uh, very uh, promising. Okay. And then PyLog can potentially be used in various scenarios, uh, right? So I have no time to go into the details. And uh, overall, our goal is to provide a new programming paradigm to target different types of uh, heterogeneous systems, right? So PyLog is uh, ongoing research, right? So um, we plan to support various heterogeneous system organizations. Uh, program or optimize hardware interface at the Python level, right? Uh, support different type of accelerators, right? So this graph um, demonstrate different levels of um, optimizations uh, targeting different use cases, right? Ranging from the fine green, right? On chip communication between different kernels or all the way to across uh, to the situation where uh, the communication can across multiple nodes. Okay. And then this can all be programmed by the PyLog uh, system, right? So here we offer an example, right? So you can see we invent a new functionality called combine that can naturally combine the different accelerators, right? So uh, connect the inputs, the outputs, uh, et cetera. And then this can naturally target the Zydex uh, Warsaw device, right? You can see it has a different uh, heterogeneous uh, fabric, right? Then we can implement uh, the different type of kernels on top of them, connect them, uh, right? So then uh, PyLog can offer a common programming model and a compiler targeting a heterogeneous device like this, okay? So the next uh, highlighted project is called Scale uh, uh, HLS, okay? So we believe this is the first uh, uh, high-level synthesis compiler built on top of MLIR, right? MLIR is a popular uh, compilation infrastructure, right, with multi-level intermediate representation, okay? So with uh, Scale HLS, we can work with high-level synthesis designs that come with intrinsic structural or functional hierarchy, right? And then we can optimize the high-level synthesis solution at the suitable abstraction levels, right? So in the example, uh, we look at graph level, right? Loop level, directive level with different optimization passes, right? So then these are all integrated into the scale HRS, right? So the designs can be optimized at a suitable level and then the optimization can actually cumulative, right? Eventually provide a very high quality solution. So here is the overall framework, right? So I don't have a lot of time, right? But all the blue blocks and the purple blocks are developed by us, right? So you can see we offer different optimization uh, passes at different levels, right? And so we represent this design at different levels, right? And then we also provide this uh, QR estimator uh, that can help a unique uh, dialect that we build using the MLIR, right? So this high-low synthesis uh, uh, CPP dialect can carry out optimization at the directive level, and then we can automatically insert pragmas. And then we can also emit the high-low synthesis synthesizable C, C++ code that can be connected to Vavado Hello Census. So as a result, right, so uh, we can offer this end-to-end -end solution, right? So that's uh, offered for the first time. So on top of that, we have this automated DLAN space exploration, right? So that can uh, explore the multi-dimensional DLAN space and offer the uh, most uh, optimized solution. Okay, so, uh, let me present some uh, results, uh, right? So, uh, so the baseline is uh, the solution, the design passing through this MLIR 
uh, as is without uh, scale actual as optimizations. And then compared to that baseline, we offer significant uh, speed up, right? For example, for the ResNet 18 model, we offer up to 3,800 X speed up, right? So this bar uh, shows um, the different levels of optimization for graph, for, for the loop, right? For the directive and, right? And then typically uh, when we increasing the uh, uh, optimization strength, right? The speed up increases as well, right? But the, of course we also increase the resource utilization. Okay, so the good news is uh, Scale HRS is open source now, right? You can access the repository here, okay? And then because of all these unique features that we offer, right? And we offer unique advantages for both uh, researchers and the users, uh, right? So for researchers, right, rapidly implement, evaluate new heterosense optimization algorithms, uh, investigate new design space exploration, and then build the end-to-end heterosense optimization flow, right? So uh, uh, researchers can build additional features, right, on top of this, right? For example, novel IP integration, right, things like that. And then uh, you know, for heterosense users, right, it also offers a bunch of uh, advantages. Okay, so finally, let me highlight uh, this uh, shared virtual memory uh, project we are working on, right? So shared virtual memory is an attractive system programming model, right? So there are existing solutions. For example, this one is uh, coming from NVIDIA uh, DGX, uh, but of course, uh, all their devices are homogeneous. And another example is um, demoed at the uh, Supercomputing 2020 right here. Uh, people uh, use uh, Xilinx IPGA and the AMD GPU, right? And uh, they are sharing the same uh, virtual uh, memory address. So actually one of my PhD student, um, you know, did an internship at the uh, Xilinx and who helped to uh, implement this whole system, right? So then you can see this is actually more complicated, right? Compared to this uh, homogeneous solution. And then the settings can change, right? What if you have multiple IPGAs, multiple GPUs, right? And then also how do we really reduce the performance overhead, right? So of course you can offer these uh, advantages, uh, right? So providing isolation between applications, uh, right? Pass complex data structures by reference, right? Naturally handle the data placement and movement across the whole system. But if we do not handle it well, it, did, uh, uh, it can lead to large performance overhead, right? So then our goal is to deal with uh, this, um, you know, try to mitigate uh, this overhead uh, by uh, first of all, analyzing uh, the potential issues, right? The, the bottleneck and all that, and then try to provide solution that's adaptive to different systems. Right. So this is adaptable SVM for the adaptive computing. Okay. So uh, right. So here is the framework we built. Right. So you can actually offer different alternatives, right, including software managed that needs the CPU to manage the, the translation, right, and also local hardware managed solutions. Uh, where this VM agent can access the local page table that can deal with the TLB misses, right? And then I'll go, as I mentioned, right, quantitative uh, analysis of SVM performance overhead that can lead to bespoke uh, SVM oh. implementations. And we also plan to integrate this into the Rockham framework for far reaching effects. Okay, so finally, what will be the future and the impact, right? So first of all, we want to demonstrate a working system with multi-PGA accelerators, right? Including all these nice features, right? And um, our goal is to provide such a working system uh, uh, next year, okay? And then the second uh, goal is to continue to work on the compilation and the language models. For example, we can leverage some existing work of overlay-based fast compiler linker, and then we can offer just-in-time, not 
uh, just for the software, but also for the IPG logic, right? So this is a brand new target. And if you can do that, right, you can naturally uh, target uh, the pink system, but in the same time dealing with uh, uh, the dynamic uh, uh, nature of the algorithms, uh, the, the data, right? And uh, those are the, the current uh, characteristics uh, for big data processing, right? We continue to work on the end to end scalable hydrosynthesis, targeting both edge and cloud computing. Finally, we continue to build the ecosystem and the target global impact. Right, Mingo Research and Education continue to publish high quality papers and also start to develop some new teaching modules for global dissemination. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you all for uh, being here for this panel discussion. After the four exciting presentations that we got from the um, Zanings Accelerated Compute Clusters, uh, we have some time now to ask some questions and have some discussion uh, with the leaders of these, uh, these centers. So welcome uh, all four of you uh, from everywhere in the world. And um, I would like to kick it off immediately, Gustavo, with you, as you were the first to who presented. Um, and quite some impressive work. And you have already um, some uh, great results that you have achieved with this uh, activity. Um, so one of the questions I would have for you um, that surely would interest the, the audience is, we all know that data centers uh, and data center architectures are going through big changes. And so what do you think are the most important trends that you will see in the coming years in that context? And, and how do FPJ technology play a role in that? Sure, sure, thanks. Uh, and again, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, so you're perfectly right. I, data centers are changing very, very quickly. Uh, they are facing huge demands. Uh, as we always know, uh, the data, amount of data that needs, needs to be processed across every day, and the workloads are very demanding. Uh, they are very tight deadlines. The SLAs are very strict uh, and so forth. And uh, by now, everybody knows that uh, there are two problems. One of them is that conventional architectures with CPUs cannot meet this demand. And the other one is that uh, just by scaling out using many computers, you have an energy problem. I mean, power consumption is just going crazy. So as a result, what you see is a huge amount of specialization. And this is where FPGAs are starting to appear in many, many places. Uh, not only as accelerators, but in many cases as uh, standalone devices that are actually used to put processing closer to the data so that you don't have to move the data that much or that you can actually process uh, in the network or to uh, implement disaggregated memory and so forth. Many of these things are, are now part of research that is still not entirely uh, out there yet, but I'm sure that in the next years, we're gonna see more and more specialization with the FPGAs playing a very big role providing the processing capability on all these specialized devices, right? Uh, think about every element in a data center has been an active processor where you can actually put computation. And many of those devices are gonna be based on FPGAs or ASICs in some cases, but mostly FPGAs. So this is the way I, I look at it and the way I see things developing. Okay, th thank you, thank you. So, well, we talked now a little bit about the architecture, but um, Jason, you addressed um, in your presentation uh, several aspects from a software perspective, right? And, so the question that I would like to ask you is, is uh, how, how do you see you know, the programming paradigms for these kind of high-end distributed compute systems evolve in the next five years? Do you see some new technologies or new langla languages emerging? Jason, you're on mute. Hi, you all. Very good to see you again. Um, so definitely, I think there's a lot of excitement now going on in the programming. Uh, community that uh, I probably would just highlight two. One is the use of uh, DSLs or domain specific languages that allow you to specify computation patterns in a certain domain very conveniently and efficiently. One good example is uh, Spark for big data processing, where, where you can specify this map reduce pattern very easily. Uh, another good example is the TensorFlow, uh, where you can use it to describe the uh, the neural network computation in a data flow fashion. I think a good, the both are good for the FPGA programmers because uh, just starting from C, 
where we're lacking is in this parallel computation patterns, which can all both be specified uh, conveniently in the, the DSLs. We have been some uh, interesting effort going from Spark to IPGA, TensorFlow to IPGA, I think I mentioned in my talk. Uh, the second direction I think is also uh, important and exciting is the separation of our algorithms uh, specification from performance tuning. This is largely inspired by the Halide program language uh, for image processing originally out of MIT. Um, so we used to have pragmas embedded right in the program itself, either in OpenMP or uh, in the HLS high-level synthesis tools. And the Halide's idea is that you write a section of a code just to describe the algorithm, another section to describe the performance tuning. Think about these are the program operations you can apply to that. We like that very much that uh, in a, a recent work called HydroCL, a joint work between Cornell and UCLA. So we actually build a, a, a heterogeneous programming environment just on top of that concept. And of course, we very efficient backend. And there's other progress, but let me stop here just so you can go uh, over to other panelists. Yeah, thank you, Jason. It definitely looks like we are uh having some exciting times ahead from a research perspective for sure in, in uh, you know new formalism is uh, for programming and so on that's uh, driven of course by uh, you know a lot of uh, new workloads um, which are very different than we have been used to in the past and, and talking about workloads um, I think um, Ding Chang you you in your presentation, you were briefly touching um, some of the uh, specific challenges, but also the opportunities of uh, applying heterogeneous computing to graph analytics. Um, so could you highlight a little bit more about the importance of graph analytics and, and um, you know, where uh, FPGAs could play there? Uh, hi, hello. Uh, nice to meet you again. So, um... So in terms of graph processing, we, what we see is that graph is very pervasive and actually is also very powerful to express different relationships between the entities. So we have seen many useful applications based on the graph. For example, in, in uh, recently we got a project from Digital Finance. We tried to detect or uh, detect the flaws in the massive transactions. In there, we use graph to represent the uh, relationship between different uh, 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 entities in the transactions so that we can identify the flaws. So in those kinds of applications, usually uh, the standard processor like a CPU and they are not energy efficient and they are actually cannot handle this irregular processing. And, and more importantly, most of those applications require low, uh, low latency. So that is why we, we, we're looking at uh, FPGA, which is reconfigurable uh, for low energy consumption, and also uh, because of the, the rich I/O interface for low uh, latency, so we have looked at this angle. We try to uh, address the challenges of graph processing, like irregular processing on FPGA, and eventually you want to deliver uh, some uh, some energy efficient and also low latency uh, graph accelerators. Um, so. From, from the accelerator perspective, there are many challenges and opportunities as I, I present in the talk. Even Jason just mentioned uh, among domain specific languages, that is also quite interesting in this domain. So I, I see that from that angle, we look at um, uh, uh, crop processing on FPGA. Okay. All right, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, well, you know, we have been talking about you know, new formalisms, we have been talking about uh, new architectures and so on. And, you know, related to that, Deming, I have a question for you. As your team has a, a strong pedigree, right, in, in compiler technology. And, um, and so as we see all these new um, architectures coming forward, we, we heard talk about domain specific programming languages, uh, new formalisms, and so. So the question is, is what are the new uh, promising directions in, in compiler technology and, and, and where do you see that, that world uh, move, um, especially from, from an academic perspective? 
All right, Ivo. Yeah, thanks a lot for the very interesting uh, question. So um, I think uh, this is uh, definitely driven uh, by the um, trend that uh, FPGA is uh, moving into the cloud, right? And um, FPGA is going to play an important role right, in terms of uh, accelerating various type of uh, computations, right, including uh, machine learning, right, including uh, big data, including the graph processing, et cetera. Okay. And uh, so FPGA right now is uh, intrinsically adaptive and heterogeneous, right? For example, for the new uh, Wurzel chip, right? It uh, uh, integrate uh, various type of components on the same chip, right? including uh, AI engine, right? And uh, uh, you know, a couple uh, levels of interconnect hierarchy, right? And the high um, uh, memory, right? bandwidth memory, etc. right? So then this will have a unique requirement for the programmability for the IPGA, right? So I feel uh, if uh, we can have a common language, right? For example, uh, recently we start to use uh, Python to program this kind of heterogeneous IPGA chips. Uh, we developed a, a flow called the PyLog, right? I mentioned that in my talk. So then this can naturally target both the software environment and the hardware environment. Right. And some potentially it can be extended to target various types of settings, or heterogeneous setting, right? Uh, not only on a single chip, but also across different nodes, right? And uh, uh, that uh, can be quite suitable for uh, cloud computing. Okay. And also, uh, we start to think about the scalability of this. Uh, uh, compilers, right? So uh, once we talk about programming IPGA and the IPGA is becoming bigger and bigger, right? And uh, so how do we really uh, meet that kind of challenge, right? So for example, for hello census, how can we scale it up, right? So uh, so I think the, the recent development of uh, building hello census on top of the multi-level IR is a good direction, right? So we started that effort and also we can automatically generate the pragmas and so to deliver the high quality, right? And uh, without the human uh, kind of intervention there, okay? So, uh, so in terms of the overall uh, trend, you know, I think the uh, domain specific language uh, compiler is important, right? Both, uh, uh, Jason and Ding Sheng mentioned about this. And in the same time, we see some other development uh, from other groups, uh, such as uh, Andre Dehan's group to work on the fast com compiler and linker, right? So all these are uh, interesting trends in the academia. Yeah, that's uh, definitely a whole new world that's, uh, uh, that's opening there for research in, in compiler technology, I think uh, a very exciting. Um, opportunities, I think, to contribute from a, from a research perspective. Um, thanks for that, Deming. All right, well, let's, let's kind of uh, perhaps switch a little bit from, from the technical side to um, the more organizational and, and operational side. And, and so um, one of the things that, that you showed in your presentation, Gustavo, is, well, first of all, kind of uh, an impressive ecosystem that you have been building around this infrastructure, but it does not only include universities that are, are participating in the initiative and that are leveraging uh, the work that, that you guys are doing, but also it looks like you, you have been successful in, in partnering you know, with, with industry. So could you highlight a little bit um, how, you, how you do that? And, and also perhaps what do you get from, from such an infrastructure that you do not necessarily just get from, from an uh, AWS or something like that, right? So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I, so I, that, that's a great point. I mean, I, and, and of course there are several aspects to this, right? I mean, uh, so let, let me start from the one that is a bit more remote, right? I mean, uh, what do we get from industry? Well, as all the panelists have just said, right? I mean, uh, there, are, there are many things happening uh, in hardware, in the cloud, 
in compiler technology, in applications, in workloads, and so forth. Right? Uh, and it's, it's impossible for a single group to be able to track all these things. However, if you want to work in this area, especially in cloud architecture, you need to sort of be aware of what is happening in all these fields. And collaboration with industry is what it brings us, right? Uh, we get use cases, we get ideas, we get problems, uh, things that don't work well today, because there are, those are, of course, opportunities for applying the technology and try to do something with it, right? So once you get those problems, the question is that what do you do about them, right? Well, as part of academia, we're interested in more medium and long-term research rather than short-term research. This is something that is more in the province of companies. And as part of medium and long-term research, what we're interested in is understanding those use cases and then seeing, okay, let's actually try to abstract from the technology that is available today and, and pretend that we have systems that are bigger, more powerful, have more bandwidth or have a higher frequency or have more gates and so forth and see where are we gonna be five years or 10 years from now? And then play with those ideas, right? Uh, and, and this is something that uh, where we believe that uh, academia contributes in general, not just us, that is exploring the field way ahead of technology getting there, right? I mean, uh, as you know, we have been collaborating with Silings for more than a decade. And when we started working, we were interested in FPGAs in the data center, right? I mean, uh, but in 2010, 2011, when we started, right? I mean, uh, most people did not really believe that FPGAs were going to be on the data center, right? And, and see where we are right now, right? So I think uh, the, the collaboration uh, the, with industry and the, the access to all this uh, technology, right? I mean, uh, prepares us or helps us to actually uh, see the future before it happens uh, in a way that we explore. Sometimes we explore areas that we are not going to get there, right? But it allows us to actually explore things in ways that can be very useful whenever the technology and the industry gets to that particular point. And in this particular context, I mean, the collaboration with Silings, uh, now the cluster, but also in the past, right? Having access to all this technology, having access to the boards, having this ongoing conversation, right? Not only on the, on the equipment that we have right now, but also what is coming next year, what are the plans for the next two years and so forth, right? It's extremely helpful to us because it allows us, as I said, it allows us to sort of not be focused on what can be done today, but start focusing on what can be done five years from now. When FPGAs are located in a different part of the architecture, when FPGAs have more resources, uh, when FPGAs are combined with non-volatile memory or uh, on and on and on. You can, you can look at many of these things, right? So I think uh, all these things come together in a very nice way. And, and again, allow me to take this opportunity, my name, but also the other panelists to give Silings thanks for these clusters, right? Because they had really been instrumental to push research ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. <clears throat> I think it's just because of the the high quality of the work all of you to do that that we are we are partnering right so uh um it's definitely not charity we are really impressed by the kind of work that you're doing and and uh um so and thanks for for all the contributions uh no doubt about that now talking about partnerships and and and, and ecosystems and and uh, creating communities and so some people talk uh these days a lot about open source and right? some people say open source is kind of the, the Morse law of, uh, of software, right? So I have a question for you, Jason, uh, in that context, in terms of how important do you think uh, open source and, uh, is in, in this domain and, 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 not, and together with open source standardization? And do you see specific initiatives that potentially stand out that, that really, um, you know, should, should have, uh, uh, the attention they deserve to kind of uh, move forward uh, the domain in, in this field, right? Hi, Ivo, that's a great question. Uh, I'm a big fan of our open source effort. I think that really facilitate uh, the development of an ecosystem uh, for um, the computing uh, inf systems and uh, CPUs, GPUs, and uh, more recently, IPGAs. You may remember that uh, 15 years ago when we started auto ESL for high-level synthesis, and uh, we were the first one using LLVM for hardware compilation synthesis. So that was a, a rather unusual move, but it was a very successful move. And of course, we're glad to see that uh, after the Adding's acquisition of auto ESL, uh, the, the high-level synthesis tool become uh, a widely adopted in the community. Um, so that's a, one good example to say how open source can help us. 
Um, the most recent effort on MLIR, I think it's also very promising. We are actually keeping track of that very closely and also uh, already actively building different kind of a backend on that. And uh, we had uh, uh, an active dialogue with uh, Stephen that is in our organization. Um, uh, and then uh, more recently, we also see Xilinx is making an effort in this space. It's definitely welcoming. Uh, one is that this effort to open source a part of the HIS APIs. So we don't have to just interface with high level synthesis tools through C programs. We can go to the LLVM IR level. I think that's great. Uh, recently, that the um, that the signing has also decided to open source the Merlin compiler from Falcon Computing, which is another spin-off from uh, my lab. Uh, it provides a source-to-source -source transformation from uh, C to another C program, which is very important because as HIS is uh, widely adopted, it becomes almost like a new uh, programming standard for FPGAs. So what you need to do is to get uh, the most efficient C programs too. The HRS tool so that the source to source and transformation uh, is very valuable. I, I think that effort to open source the Merlin compiler will facilitate that process. I mean, if I remember correctly, that uh, your student, I uh, Shiha, was on his PhD committee. His pilot actually has a pass, goes through Merlin compiler uh, to HRS. So that's kind of an example. It says that the once you open source, then it is up to the community to build all sorts of a paths and the passes and the flows. I think there will be a lot of excitement coming up in the next few years with more of an open source effort. Okay, thank you. That makes a lot of sense, of course. <clears throat> now, talking about uh, you know leveraging uh, others' work and standing on the shoulders of, of giants, I would say, I have a question, uh, Bing Cheng, uh, for you in terms of, um, you know, when we talk about ecosystem industrial cooperation, I, I would assume, and I witnessed uh, that uh, the XACC program, the members of that program definitely are, are working together or leveraging each other's work and so on. Um, so Bing Cheng, could you, could you say a little bit about, about that, how, how you uh, leverage and, and, and work together with the other centers and, 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 and their technology? Yeah, thanks. So, uh, yeah, so thanks. First of all, thanks for signing for uh, the, the, the hardware donations. And uh, that's very important. Um, uh, that helped us to do research on, on a lot of different opportunities. Let me give you some examples. Um, first of all, I think uh, we, through XACC, we can get access to the latest FPGA technology by Xynix. So basically, we, we have FPGA now with, with and without uh, high bandwidth memory, HBM. And also we have Smart Leak. So we have different, uh, so through those hardware, we can really access the latest um, FPGA technologies. And from there, from there, we can do a lot of interesting research. For example, now in our uh, server, we have one machine with four FPGA. So in this, in this setup, we can actually research how our, our big data system, machining system can scale uh, in terms of the number of FPGAs on a single machine. So this is, we, we call scale up uh, architectures. And then on the other hand, we also have, have another setup is FPGA on different machines. So this basically is a distributed set, setup. So we can actually research how the data a big data system like GWAV or other machine learning system scale as the number of machine, as the number of FPG in the distributed settings. So I think XACC really give us this um, opportunity and diversity to, to research different angles of interesting and also fundamental problems. And beside, beside that, actually the XACC, not just hardware, but in, in just software, just now uh, uh, we also like uh, Gustavo and Jason also mentioned that uh, open source system, open source is very important. So Xynix actually created this um, uh, software and libraries website, and that allow us to, to share our, our open source uh, system uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this visible platform. So uh, even they, they, uh, we can offer some Docker, Dockerize, we can uh, Dockerize a, a, a release that can run on Docker. So that I think potentially people can, can get access to 
all those different kind of open source uh, systems. And and finally, as in in people, I think we is is really XACC is a vehicle that bring us together in terms of uh, the researchers among different uh, content continents and also academia and uh, industry Zynex here to actually we have regular meetup. So this is really helpful to exchange our, our latest research outcome and also our uh, thinkings about the future. I think that is very important. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Bing Sheng. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, take perhaps a minute or so, perhaps to have give Alonso a chance also um, to make a comment here, because I saw in your presentation, Alonso, you, you kind of highlighted some of the, you know, the technology that, that is available, right, for, for others to, to leverage and, and from different groups. And so could you, could you highlight that short, in, in a short way? Sure, I, you know, I, I, as as things change so quickly, right? I mean, uh, and what, 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 let me take one step back. I mean, why why is open source important or has been important in software? Because having open source allows you to build many things without having to build the whole stack from scratch every time you want to do something. Uh, this, to a certain extent, is still missing on FPGAs. Uh, so the effort that you are referring to is we are trying to sort of build things like network stacks, like uh, shells, uh, applications, uh, and basic tools. So that for people uh, to be able to use an FPGA without having to invest so much time in having an infrastructure, right? Uh, and um, I think the, as, as Bing Shen has said, right? Uh, I think the clusters are allowing to have a critical mass that otherwise is difficult to reach, right? Uh, so now we have a vehicle where people can actually have uh, all, these, all these things running. They can actually exchange. We have a community that is growing. So I think from that perspective, uh, this infrastructure that is very much needed, right, uh, and we're very happy to contribute to it, uh, is starting to appear thanks to these clusters and this, this initiative, right, of creating these, these centers of research where everybody converges and can start sharing the work that they're doing. All right, thank you. Thank you, and so we are kind of uh, reaching on the, the end, I think. I would like to ask the main kind of final question, perhaps, um, you know, Giving all the insights that that you have uh, gained over the years in, in data center and um, the evolution of compute nodes and the challenges for compilers and so on. So where do you think are in the future going to be the priorities from a research perspective and, and where do you see potential breakouts um, for the future evolution of compute nodes in high-end systems? Is, is it going to be on the memory side? Is it going to be kind of more parallel architectures? Is it, uh, you know, having more powerful connectivity? It's probably a little bit of all of that, but I would imagine that there are certain aspects of that that are more important than others. And I would like to get your perspective a little bit on that, Deming. All right, <laughs> thank you. This is a big question uh, I will try. So I think you're right. Uh, got to be, uh, uh, you know, the combination of the, the factors you mentioned. Uh, but I think, um, uh, you know, better memory interface, uh, better connectivity uh, is very important, right? So uh, that's how we can really scale up and also how to deal with the big data challenge uh, in, the, in the cloud, right? So I, I think what uh, Zydinx uh, is uh, working on right now is uh, very relevant. Uh, for example, uh, recently Xilinx uh, pushed out this uh, SN1000 uh, smart NIC cards, right? So uh, because of that, it can uh, improve uh, the software defined uh, technology, right? So these days uh, people are talking about software defined networking, you know, software uh, defined storage, and then with uh, this uh, smart NIC that can actually connect the different components uh, in the cloud much better, right? And uh, so I feel, um, you know, a technology like that uh, added with additional functionality such as uh, security, right? Such as uh, high programmability uh, will make a big difference, right? So in terms of the memory interface, uh, I think one technology 
Um, one trend is important, which is the shared virtual memory. And I think both AMD and the Xilinx are moving towards uh, that direction. For example, uh, people start to uh, you know, build on top of this um, uh, Rockham uh, environment uh, where IPDAs and GPUs and potentially other accelerators can communicate much better, right? Uh, addressing the shared virtual memory, right? So I think this kind of technology uh, would help uh, to improve the overall efficiency, scalability, and uh, you know, heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity is also important because then we can provide customized adaptive computing, uh, right, for high performance to reduce energy consumption. Right, so all these are important trends. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Deming, thank you so much. And, and on that note, I uh, would like to conclude this session here because we are running already a little bit over time. And uh, uh, I would like to thank all of you for uh, willing to spend uh, your time. I'm really honored that uh, uh, you were willing to do that. Um, and uh, I would like to congratulate you also for the great work. Uh, from a Xilinx perspective, I can say um, that we see a lot of good ideas and, and good work coming out of these uh, um, accelerated compute clusters. And it is our intention to extend that network um, um, to uh, more uh, initiatives. And uh, uh, we hope that um, we can grow this and that both the university ecosystem as well as the industry can leverage uh, the results of this work. And, and this can be a catalyst for, for driving uh, some of the work and for the future of, of data centers. So uh, thank you all so much for making the time. Um, uh, for some of us, it's an, an ungodly early hour, um, but uh, I think you all were willing to do that and stepping in. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the great work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. And, thank uh, you. Bye. Thank you.